Last week's uh, message was on love. Most of the verses we covered were uh, uh, in regards to the love that we have for each other. Paul gives us some practical ways uh, to love each other. But then in the last verses, he talks about the love that we should have for uh, our enemies. Those that don't necessarily love us back when we love them. And that last section was easier read than, than done, obviously, right? It's harder to love those that persecute us. But then again, that, that's that godly love, that's that agape love that, that we saw um, showed for us on the cross. That's a, that's a love that the Lord showed for us by coming down while we were yet sinners, while we were yet his enemies. He came and died for us. That's the same kind of love that we are to show for others. A sacrificial love, right? It wouldn't be a sacrificial love if it was easy to do, right? So that's the kind of love Paul uh, talked about. Love within the brethren, and like Rob says, the sister, um, and love towards the unbelievers, towards the world. Okay, We should love each other unconditionally. And sometimes I'll admit, in the church, it's kind of hard uh, uh, to love other brothers and sisters because there's going to be strife. We're going to bump heads, and there's going to be things that, disagreements that uh, we will have to talk over and things like that. But then again, there should always be reconciliation. Okay? Uh, today we're going to look at a different topic. Paul is talking about authority. We're going to talk not so much about politics, but about uh, how we should behave under uh, the government that has been placed over us. Here, well, we live in the United States. The government here is, is the American government. You have the Constitution, you have the laws, you got the White House, the Cabinet, Senators, you got the Armed Forces, all kinds of governments going on, right? If you're in the Marines, well, you, got, uh, you, you have other officials that are over you, so the government... Uh, can be distinct as far as me, maybe a minister, right? But we are all under the same government of the United States. Paul here is writing about um, how we as Christians should behave. Obviously, we should be good citizens wherever we're at, whether we're first century Christians under Rome or, or uh, you know, 21st century Christians under in, in the USA or anywhere else for that matter. If you're a believer, you're under a certain uh, man-made government. And that's what Paul's going to talk about today. You might be thinking, well, Albert, this is probably a better message for the prison ministry. You know, because you know, we, we pretty much obey the law, right? Or not. You know, sometimes as a believer, as a new believer, one of the things that I used to do a lot was uh, I would download movies. How many of you guys are familiar with torrents? You know, um, raise your hand if you're familiar with torrents. Okay, okay, we got some computer guys here. Uh, so you download torrents, and a lot of them have good quality copies. Like instead of going to pay your movie theater price, uh, you can just watch, download it on your PC and watch it at home. It was almost equal quality, so it was easier. I told myself, well, this is sort of illegal, maybe, maybe not. The gray area, I'm under grace type. You know, I try to justify myself. But then the Lord, the Lord told me, hey, just give that up, give that up. And you know what? Eventually, I, I thought I wasn't going to be able to do it because I had so many movies in this terabyte I had. And we would just watch it all the time. But, you know, I gave that up. And, and the Lord, as you grow in Christ, the Lord will, you know, help you uh, to give things up. Right? We let go. Of we shed things off. You know, that's just one example. You know, back taxes. All these kinds of things are the things we're going to talk about this morning. I outlined the message in, into four C's. First is consequence. Second is, is conscience. The third is charity. And the fourth is Christ. Easy to... Uh, to remember for you. So we're going to cover the first four verses here after we, uh, we open up in prayer. Another good example, though, of, uh, of a person, of a godly man that was under uh, several governments was, is Joseph. Remember Joseph in the Old Testament? Joseph, the son of Jacob, he, was fur he started off in the government of, of his father, Jacob. Jacob was over Joseph and the rest of the 12 kids, right? It was a total of 12. Uh, but then he was sold into slavery. He ended up in Potiphar's house, and he was under the government of Potiphar. He was a good servant. He served well under Potiphar. Eventually, he was locked up, not, but not because he did anything wrong, but because of Potiphar's wife. But even in prison, even under the prison government, he was a good, he was a good steward there. He was a good servant, and the Lord blessed that. Eventually, he was second to, to Pharaoh, and he was in charge over a lot of things, even in that government. So the Lord blessed this godly man, in, in, under every government he was in. And that's a picture of how we as Christians, you know, how, how we should behave. Because we are, we all, you know, some of us have jobs and, and we work. We, we have bosses. How should we behave? You know, uh, uh, family government. 
Did you know that there are four governments in the Bible? First, we, we find it in Genesis chapter 2. We have the government of the family. We got Adam as the head. Husbands are to, to be the leaders of the home. And you got the wife, which should submit to their husbands. Husbands should love uh, their wives as Christ loved the church. Not in a relationship of, of slavery of any kind, but that's the order. That's a government that God set up in the fam family home. When we read uh, Exodus chapter 20, we look at the Ten Commandments, and we see that children are under their parents. So you see this paradigm, this hierarchy, this government in the home, children, uh, mothers, and then fathers, right? Well, government of love and order, and that's how the Lord uh, in instituted the government of the family. But that's the first government. Second government is found in the land, and we talked about it already. We're under the government of the United States here. I don't need to mention too much about that right now. The third government is the church government. We see that after the cross. We see it when the Holy Spirit comes down. We see when the church is established, that government. We see the, 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 the pastor and the head elders, and then we have the laity and, and the, the deacons and then the laity. That's church government, and it should function that way as well. Now, the fourth government, which is the most important one of all, is God's government, heaven's government. God is over all governments. God is over all authorities, right? And we should, we should remember that God is the one that is over today's government, right? We should submit. We should always remain under God's government. Because if we try to go above God's government, we're going to see problems in every other government, every other authority, whether it's a home or, or, or a, you know, the, the country we live in or, or our jobs, there's going to be problems. So let's begin with a, with a word of prayer before uh, we start reading here. Father, I thank you again for each and every person here, Lord. I pray you, uh, you would open uh, our minds, Lord, open our hearts. Speak to us, Father God. Show us the application here, Lord. Show us how we can uh, uh, better follow your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's read the first four verses here of Romans chapter 13. Paul says now, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. Try to count how many times you read this word, authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So we see several things here just in the, just in the first four verses. We see authority mentioned five times. I don't know if you counted them. Authority and authorities, it's the same Greek word. Mentioned five times just within the first three verses. We're talking about government here. The literal word uh, is powers. Powers. Those powers that, that are over us. It's interesting to me as I'm studying, I, I, I had time to do a little bit of a, a Greek word studying here. And we see here, when I was looking at the word subject, uh, the word subject in Greek is hypotasso. Hypotasso. And the, work, the, the, the third word after it, which is governing, you guys with me still? Subject, and then we move to governing. Governing is hyper echo. And that's interesting to me because I come from the medical field. Hypo means low. When you have low blood pressure, it's hypotension. When you have high blood, high blood pressure, it's hypertension. So what Paul is saying here, let every soul be low. That is, be subject to the governing, those things that are above us, to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. God has placed every authority there is on the land. Now, that's not to say, guys, that God voted for the current president, okay? That's not to say that God approved of, of each and every dictator, Hitler, uh, Stalin, Popa, you know, uh, North Korean, you know, president. That doesn't mean that God approves of each and every leader. But that does mean that God has allowed them to be on there for a certain time. And we as believers, we are to submit to whoever our leader is. Okay? Does that make sense? Let me put it like this. Let me give you an example. God instituted the government of, 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 of the family, right? Of the family home. He said, whether you're a Christian or not, if you come from Adam and Eve, the husband is to be the head of the house. He's to be the leader, and the wife is to submit to his, her husband, as, as the Lord has ordered. However, that doesn't mean that God approves of every husband that beats his wife. That doesn't mean that God approves of every husband that fails to be a leader. Okay? That makes sense? 
there's a government, but that doesn't mean that God approves of the person in charge of, of the government. That's something we need to uh, take into consideration here. Notice that during this time, Nero was the, gov the, the, the emperor here. Now, while, uh, while at this time he hadn't started to persecute Christians, as he's going to in a couple years from the time this was written, you know, a lot of Christians were, would be turned into human candles. They would be turned into human candles, and they would, he, he would light them on fire so he can light up the, uh, give light to his orgies. He, he, he would uh, sew uh, animal skins on Christians and throw them to the lions and to uh, ferocious uh, beasts for entertainment. This is a, the, the president of the time when Paul wrote this. And yet Paul is saying we as Christians are to submit literally to, to go under, to arrange ourselves under whatever government there is. Now, we'll get to the part where I do tell you the, the, the clause. Okay, we're going to talk about the clause and the fine print in a little bit. But that's what Paul is basically saying here. We, you know, we, we are to submit to the powers that are over us. You know, it's an interesting, interesting thing as you, as when you read the Bible and you understand how God deals with certain governments. I've noticed this pattern when, um, for example, Canaan. You know Canaan in the Old Testament? The promised land? Well, they were very wicked. Sodom and Gomorrah were part of Canaan. Okay, they were Canaanite territories, and they were very wicked as well. And God destroys those, those cities. God gave the wicked uh, you know, uh, land of Canaan to the Israelites. And then when the Israelites started misbehaving, the northern kingdom, well, the Assyrians came, and God allowed the Assyrians, a more wicked government, to take them over. When the southern kingdom were misbehaving as well, about 100 years later, Babylon came, the bigger bully of the time, and they took them over. And so the cycle continues. Persia took over Babylon, and Alexander the Great comes, and then we got the Romans, and, and so on, right? It's interesting because when a country becomes uh, internally uh, immoral and weak, it's not long after that the, 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 the walls are taken down, and, and another government comes and takes them over. And that is my fear here in the, in the United States. We've, we've taken the Bible out of the schools. We, we, we even, there's, there's talk about, I'm not sure if they've done it already, but, you know, uh, placing a demonic statue uh, next to the Ten Commandments, you know, in a public square, that, that's terrible. It's only a matter of time. But this is what we see here. He says, likewise, submit. No government can, um, can boast about their powers because God has given them to them. Look at what Jesus says. He's having a conversation with Pilate. Pilate was trying to boast a little bit. This is what Pilate says to Jesus in John 19. He says, and, th and this is right before he gets crucified. He says, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, are you not speaking to me? Do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? <coughs> Jesus answered, you could, not ha you could have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you, given you from above. And that's usually how it is all the time. You know? there, the power comes from God. And we have the right to vote. You know, we have the, con the, 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 the Constitution. You know, we, we, we are, what is it, the, the first one, it says, you know, we have the freedom of, of speech, the freedom of a press, the freedom of religion, right? So, so we have that to our advantage. We can vote, and sometimes when you vote, you've got to vote for the lesser evil, right? You might have one candidate that says he's a Christian, but you know he's not a Christian by the things he does, right? By the things he approves. Then you've got another candidate, candidate that theologically you might not agree with. He might be a Mormon. I don't agree with him. I wouldn't go to his church. But I agree with him in, in, in the values that he has. He's against abortion. He's against homosexual marriage, right? So then sometimes you've got to vote for the lesser evil. Because sometimes when you don't vote, you're still voting anyway, right? Does that make sense? And these are the things we, we have to decide as Christians. We have a voice. We must speak out. We must preach the gospel. It is not so much that we go against government, okay? It's not so much that we give hate speech. But what happens, let's say this is... Uh, you know, this is, God's, this is God's power. This is God's government. And then you have uh, the, the man-made government, right? God's government, man-made government, and when this is us, okay? We are under both. However, it's not so much that we go over man-made government, that we defy the government, as much as it is the government trying to go above God's word and redefining marriage and saying that murder is okay as long as it's inside the, the womb, Right? So we haven't moved, it's government. It's different governments that become immoral and wicked and they go above God's word. We are to stand true. 
but we are not to overthrow any government. We, we can't do that. Look at Jesus, for example, right? Did he, did he resist arrest? No. When Judas came, he gave him a peck on the cheek, and then they took him off. He, they, 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 he allowed himself to, to get taken. Did he come down from the cross to, to, you know, to whoop some butt and then go back up on the cross? He didn't do that. He could have if he wanted to, but he didn't. And, and that's what he calls us. He, calls us. he doesn't call us to resist arrest. Paul would be beheaded by this same government that he's telling the other Christians to, to submit to. And that's the call he gives us, all of us. Whether we agree with the government or not, that's beside the point. We might not um, you know, uh, respect the person on government, but we should respect the office. This is what he says in, in, in verse 3, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. And that's pretty, pretty much common sense, right? You know, if you think about it, if there was no government, it would be worse. It would be worse than it is now, because everybody would be doing what they thought was right in their own, in, in their own sight. There would be a lot of rape going on, there would be a lot of murders, thefts, mobbing. It would be terrible. But we do have a government. You know, and that sort of keeps peace. That this is what Paul is saying. Hey, obey the government. You don't want to be scared? Do what is right. There are consequences whether you're a believer or an unbeliever. You break the law, you're going to pay the fine. If I want to speed up, if I want to speed and break the law, and I get caught up, I can't complain. If I want to uh, get off of my car because somebody uh, uh, cut me, and I punch him in the face, I might get a, mil a 10 million hits on YouTube, but I can't complain when I'm locked up, right? And things like that. We can't complain because we've broken God's law. Now, one time, I think a, a year ago, I, uh, I got a ticket for speeding over and uh, by uh, the 8 over here. I was almost, I had almost, uh, I probably had like 2-3 miles before I crossed the ocean to ocean uh, bridge there, but a CHP got me and uh, when, he, when he pulled me over, he said I was speeding, but when I was pulled over, I was not speeding. He said that I was speeding some five miles back, and I didn't like that. Why didn't he just pull me over five miles back? So it was kind of—I thought it was kind of shady. So I said, "Okay, let's—I'm uh, going to fight it." So I go and fight it, and I show up to the court, and he ends up. I was hoping that he wouldn't show up, but he showed up, and uh, <laughs> and uh, he showed up to the thing, and uh, and I was like, "Lord, I'm your child. Uh, give me the victory in Jesus' name." And and I was praying really hard, and I was hoping that was going to work, but that didn't work. You know, I broke the law, and and I paid the fine. And, and, that, and that's how it is. You know, there, there is no preference. God has this instituted the law. He says basically here, if you disobey the law, if you resist the law, you're basically resisting God's law. And that's something we need to take care of uh, as well. He says, hey, they're ministers for good in verse 4. Verse 5. It says, therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath. This is the next section. We're going to talk about our conscience here. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So not because you're going to get in trouble, you should do right, but because it's the right thing to do. Okay? God, has given us, God has given every person a conscience. Now, we can either choose to suppress the truth, suppress our consciences, and get a seared conscience and a debased mind that happens, or we can just, hey, do what is right. You know what I like about the, the, the fact that, you know, we, we, not, we don't only have a conscience, but we have a Holy Spirit that drives our conscience. That's the benefit that you and I have. See, it's like everybody's born with a conscience. In the, uh, Romans chapter 2, I think verses 15 and 16 talk about, you know, everybody has a conscience. That's general revelation. That's why people know that it's wrong to kill and murder and, you know, all these things without knowing the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Instinctively, they know it. But we have the, the Holy Spirit that helps us drive that conscience. He sort of takes over the steering wheel and helps us to, uh, to do what is right. And that's what Paul's saying here. Hey, guys, just, you know, do what is right because of, for conscience sake. Again, be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. And what he's trying to say here is, yeah, we, we pay taxes. We pay taxes, and that ta part of the taxes go to pay those ministers, to pay the government as well. Okay? And Paul is saying, hey, yeah, give to what Jesus said, give to Caesar, render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Right? If, if the, the image is, is Caesar's image, we'll give it to, to Caesar. But Albert, I, I'm working under the table. Well, bring it up to Jesus. What would Jesus say if you told him, I'm working under the table, it's not so bad. Or I got some back taxes I haven't paid, it's not so bad. That's between you, know, that's between you and the Lord. I see it as... That can't go against what it says here. He says, hey, 
you got to pay taxes. Notice this, the IRS back then wasn't any more popular than the IRS is today. Okay? The tax collectors back then also were known for pocketing money. You know, they, they were despised people. Yet Paul is saying, he's aware of all this, yet he says, pay your taxes, guys. You guys Christian? You guys are Christians? Pay your taxes. This is what we see throughout the scriptures. Follow the law. Follow the law. You got some back taxes? Pay them off. I heard somebody say, uh, what do they say? You know, when you're filing your taxes, make sure you put your biggest dependent, which is the government, because you end up paying them more. But this, this is what we see here. He says, use your conscience. Now he's going to give us a, a list of five of the Ten Commandments. Notice uh, the interesting thing, the similarities between these. Render therefore to all their due taxes, to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Okay, I skipped a few verses here. But verse 7, so I don't skip verse 7, he's saying it's not just taxes, it's not just customs and, and fees, but also honor. And fear, right? We, we honor the Marines, you know, the, the, the Army, the Navy, those that protect us. You know, that there's a certain honor we give them, right? We value them. We appreciate them. The flag goes down when, 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 when some of them, you know, are, are killed, especially in our country just not so long ago. You know, that there is that honor, and, and that's a biblical thing, okay? It's a biblical thing to, to appreciate the, the government, those that are over us, and doing the right thing. See, because the purpose of the government, it has two purposes, to serve and to protect, Right? To serve the people and protect the people. Now, I will agree, not all, it doesn't work like that all the time, but Paul says the same thing over and over. Pay your taxes. Give honor to whom honor is due. Now, verse 8 to 10, he, he switches it up a bit, and he talks about what he talked about in, in the previous chapter. Now he's going to talk about love. Okay, Loving other people. Not necessarily just Christians, but loving others. He says in verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And that reminds me of what Jesus says in the Gospels. He, said, he says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And Jesus did just that, right? He kept the law perfectly. Nobody else could do that. He kept the law perfectly, and he went to the cross and died as the Lamb of God. He paid for our sins. He was our, our, our atonement, our substitutionary atonement. But now as, as we walk in love, the law is fulfilled. Does that make sense? It's not that I have to, well, I can't light a fire on Saturday anymore, or I can't eat bacon. No, it's none of that stuff. It, it, it's, it's in Christ Jesus. It's in love. It's, it's very simple. It is fulfilled by loving others. And he's going to break it down for us. Look at what he says in verse 9. For the commandments, notice he's referring to the Ten Commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Do you notice the similarity within these commandments? He missed a couple, right? He didn't give us the whole list of the Ten Commandments. The thing is, he gave us uh, most of the, uh, he missed one of the, uh, one commandment in regards to our love for each other. The one that says, you know, honor your mother and father. You see, the Ten Commandments, if you didn't know this already, I'm assuming you don't. I'm assuming some of you don't. That's what I'm saying. That's why I'm saying it. But Ten Commandments were divided into two, basically. Love God, love your neighbor. The first four are in regards to God. Don't worship any idols. Put him first. Keep the Sabbath and all these things. The, the, the last six commandments are in regards to man. Don't cover, you know, don't cover your neighbor's things. Don't, 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 don't cover your neighbor's wife or his property, you know, and, and so on. Paul is basically saying, he's implying that these guys already know that you put God first, but he's saying here in regards to loving your neighbor, he's putting it in a nutshell, just like Jesus did in the New Testament. He says, hey, all of these are summed up. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus said, right? New Testament, he says, uh, the, the greatest commandment is this. You shall love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Paul is just echoing what Jesus said here. And if we do these things, if we do these things, we're going to fulfill the law. Does that make sense? Now, what are some ways we can be stingy with our love? Because we've already experienced agape love. Now, we're, we're not told to keep it to ourselves. We're to be loving to other people. Um, let me give you a few examples. If I choose to be unforgiving, let's say Rob uh, Wilson over there, he backs up into my car and, and, and he takes off. And I see him do it, but he, he, do, he doesn't know I saw him. If he takes off, 
and, and I'm, I don't tell him anything. I'm waiting for him to come and tell me to back up into my car. And he doesn't, and I start resent, being unforgiving and resenting him. That's a, problem. That's a lack of love. Okay, because remember, we're talking about agape love, sacrificial love, regardless of what people do, say, or don't do for us, right? So that's an example. Harboring unforgiveness is being stingy with your love. Jesus says, don't do it. You've been forgiven, forgive others. A second way to be stingy with our love is when we, uh, when we love others with strings attached. For example, if we love others because they love us back, or if we love others because we know we're going to get something in return, that's being stingy with our love as well. We're, we're being biased and we're having preference. Jesus, Jesus didn't just go to the lovable people. He went to the unlovable for the most part. He went to, to those people that were rejected by society. And that's how we should be as well if we want to not be stingy with our love. Another way we can be stingy is when we, uh, when we don't love people because they don't meet our standards. And I can relate a little bit more to that. I have a sister. Not, not this sister. I got another sister. Younger sister. <laughs> Uh, but she, she, you know, she, she, she gets in trouble a lot with the police now, and, and um, not to give too much info on her, but um, I, I warned her before she ever got in trouble. I told her, hey, Floor, you know, you, you, uh, you're going this way, and you're gonna end, these things are going to end up happening to you if you continue to do these things. And I said, me and you are going are gonna to have a lot of trouble in the future if you don't stop doing what you're doing now. And she didn't listen. She kept doing, you know, she, she's a teenager. She knows everything. And um, she continued to do that. And now she's reaping the consequences of what she did. So then fast forward, when it comes time for me to uh, socialize with her, I'm like, sometimes it's hard for me to love her because I, I told you so, right? I can't, how am I going to love you now that if you weren't listening to me? That's a hard part sometimes. But God says, no, you, you got to love him regardless. Look at the prodigal son, for example. Prodigal son, he, he, he took the, the father's money and he squandered it. But then he repented and he came back. Did the father put him to work? Did he make him a servant like he wanted? No. What does the father do? He does four things for him. He makes a, a barbecue for him. He fills his belly. He covers his back with the robe, a picture of our righteousness, by the way. He gives him a ring, and he gives him the sandals, right? He just embraces him. And that's how we are to be. We are to be loving and not necessarily judgmental, right? We can't be stingy with our love. You see, love doesn't have a, a bankruptcy form, right? We're always going we can, you can pay your car off, you can pay your house off, your debt can be paid, but your love will never be paid. There is no bankruptcy form for that. And this is what Paul says, hey, love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love fulfills it all. Now look, the second, the fourth part here, verses 11 to 14 are very, pretty interesting, but they're still in regards to government, okay? He, here he's talking about the government that, that we have, we're under God. We're always under God. But he puts Christ into the equation. It says in verse 11, And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. He's talking about the consummation of all things. See, the, the early church believed that Jesus Christ was coming very soon. And, and rightly so. Jesus says, you know, the same way I left, I'm going to come back. And he, and he talked in Matthew chapter 23 about, you know, not to be sleeping, to be watchful, to be sober. Because his return would be soon. Did Jesus, has Jesus come in, in the almost 2,000 years that it's been since he's left? No, he hasn't come. Are, are, is Paul and Peter in heaven thinking, well, you know, if I would have known he wasn't coming, I could have spent more time golfing. Are they, you think, we really think they're like that? No. They live like Jesus was coming that same day. And that's why they were able motivated to, to live for Christ, to do everything they could because they believed Jesus was coming back that same day. They believed the return of Christ was imminent. And I think that's the same motivation that we should have. Whether Jesus comes tomorrow or 2,000 years from today, our motivation should be we should live like he's coming tonight. And this is what I see here from Paul. He says in verse 12, the night is far spent. He gives us a picture, you know, he says, he tells us to wake up first, and then he says, it's, it, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness, lust, not in strife and envy. Notice how he puts strife and envy in the same context here, in the same list of, of, of uh, uh, what is it, uh, drunkenness and, and revelry and, and, and all these other sins. These are serious sins. 
envy and, and lust. But Paul says in verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Now it's very interesting to me because he doesn't just give us a put on, but he tells us to, to put off some things, right? He says, stop doing these, these things, take these things off and start putting on Christ in your life. And to put Christ on doesn't mean, mean that you're not wearing Christ already. We, we, we already have Christ, but we are to walk, right? We are to walk circumspectly, walk like, you know, as Christ walked. Uh, Ephesians talks about the, the armor of God. He says to walk in the armor of light. You know, I think it's in the same context, you know. We, we are to put on the helmet of salvation. Acknowledge that we're saved and we've been freed. Uh, put on the belt of truth. Be people that, you know, our yes is yes and our no is no. You know, uh, have the, the shield of faith. We are to walk boldly and not looking back forward, but to be walking by faith. You know, we're to have the, the, the sword of the spirit. We, we, you know, we, the feet shod with the gospel, preaching the gospel at all times, you know. The, uh, what, what am I missing? You know, the, the breastplate of righteousness, you know, seeking holiness, all these things. The wording here is to put on, but it just means to walk in what is already inside of you. Because you are born again, because you are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Our f last point is this. Let me see if I can find it, if I can even remember it. <clears throat> we can't afford to hit snooze. We cannot afford... To its news. He says, you know, wake up Christians. Don't be a sleepy Christian. We can't afford to its news. We've got to live like Jesus is coming back tonight. I'm going to end with this. There are four kinds of Christians. Or at least in my sermon, there are four kinds of Christians. But um, th th there's the, the, the sleepwalker Christian, okay? The sleepwalker Christian um, does a lot of walking in the dark. So because they walk in the dark and they don't walk in the light, they stumble over things. They stumble over people. They leave things unorganized. They leave things uh, unhinged and open, you know, and they wake up in places that they wouldn't have woken up unless they were walking in the light. They live with regret. We don't want to be the sleepwalker Christian, right? We want to walk in the light. We want to have that accountability so if we are walking in darkness, somebody can tell us, hey, brother, you're going to stumble. You're going to stumble if you keep walking in this direction. The Bible tells us in Psalms, you know, that the... the uh, um, God's word is a light on a lamp onto our feet to help us walk accordingly. Don't be a sleepwalking Christian. Secondly, we got the snoozer, right? And that would be me in the literal sense. I push I push snooze several times before I even get up. I was reading an article that um to help you sort of get up when you're supposed to get up. When you put your alarm, make sure you put your phone uh, away from you somewhere where you have to get up. You can't just reach over, hit snooze or whatever. You do that. And then your blood will start pumping and hopefully you won't go back to bed. Also, if you're a coffee drinker, set your machine to like five minutes before your alarm so you know that's waiting for you as well. Uh, don't go to bed on a full stomach or an empty stomach. They say that helps. And also don't go to sleep too late or it's going to be harder, obviously, common sense, right? But the snoozer, in, in a Christian sense, they would be the chronic procrastinator. They have good intentions. They know what the right thing is. They know Jesus is coming soon, but they never get around to doing those things, right? We don't want to be the procrastinator. Well, I had good intentions, Lord, but I never really got around to it. I was, you know, I always resorted back to, to my old, old ways. You don't want to be the nominal Christian. You don't want to be the Christian that just go to, goes to church but isn't the church. Does that make sense? And the third one. First we got the, the, the sleepwalker Christian, then, then we got the snoozer, and then we have the night owl. The night owl is the one that, not necessarily that is engaging in sin, but the night owl is the one that they really is very liberal with the privileges that they have in Christ. Paul talks about, you know, uh, uh, you know all, things not, all things are good, but not all things edify. I can eat whatever I want if I want to, right? But it's not going to be a benefit to me if I overindulge in things, if I start committing gluttony and all, this, all these things. Entertainment is okay, but if I overfill myself with entertainment and pleasure, then how am I going to have time for the Lord? See, the night owl is up busy doing other things, so when, it comes, when it's morning time, they don't have time for Jesus. They don't have time to spend time with the Lord. Instead of, instead of making their schedules uh, around Jesus, they put Jesus outside of their schedules, if, if they even have any time for Jesus at all. You don't want to be the night owl. You don't want to be so full of the things that, that don't edify of the material things and, and not have enough of Christ. You don't want to be that lukewarm Christian. The fourth one is, is actually a positive one. You want to be the early bird Christian, right? 
You got something set in place. You got people that, if, 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 that you know you can trust, that you can confess your sins to, right? You watch some, some things you shouldn't be watching. You got a brother that you know you can confide in, and you go and you confess your sins, as the Bible says, and you have reconciliation, and you walk in the Spirit, right? It's good. The Bible says in, uh, in the Old Testament, it says, uh, it's better if there's, there's two, because if one falls into a ditch, the other one is there to pick him up. I'm paraphrasing, by the way. Um, you know, he has those things set up. The early bird gets up, and he meets with Jesus. The early bird gets up and he meets with Jesus before he meets with anybody else because, you know, he knows that works. He knows that's the right thing to do. That's the Christian we want to be. You know, who are you? Are you the sleepwalker? Or are you the night owl? Are you the snoozer? Or who do you want to be is the real question, right? I want to end with this verse. It's found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 to 8. Now you can go there um, if you want. I'm going to go ahead and start reading it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5 to 8. Paul says, You are all sons of light and sons of the day. Same thing he was saying here. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, Notice, love, key to what he was saying previously, and as, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. That, that is what we should have in the forefront of our minds, right? The culmination of our salvation, the coming of Jesus, doing things as unto the Lord. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for each and every person that, that is here, Lord. Lord, I, I, I'm, I just ask, Lord, that, that you would fill us with your spirit, Lord. Help <clears throat> us to be more like you, Lord. Lord, your word was spoken, Lord. I pray that, that your word will continue, Lord. That uh, we understand when we believe that your word does not come back, come back void. We ask, Lord, for more of your love. Help us love others, Lord. Help us obey the laws. Help us not to take lightly of them, whether they're small, small things, Lord. Help us to be obedient 100% to you, Lord. And help us love our neighbor as ourselves. In Jesus' name.